and you put a, an arc, which is the opposite way, and you put that same arc in tension. But the, the first bridges back in the Roman days, they didn't have the steels and so forth to make tension wires, so they built stones and they built the arch in it. Well, it's the same thing for an engine. It has to have a radius. Now, the end plate, I said it has to, the, the, the higher the radius, the larger the radius, the more stress that you achieve. And the more stress you achieve as it becomes flatter and flatter. And when you get flat like a real head is on an engine, now you've got an infinite stress. And it's so much so that they make the head very thick. And they bolt it down. And no matter how much they bolt it down, you can tear the bolts off of the head just with a little bit of pressure because the head wants to bend. And that bending action bends on the bolts and it tears it loose. And if you ever hear about a race engine on a car, they blew the engine. What they've done is blown the head. It no longer can carry the stresses that are in it. So as a result of that, being a, and engines have been around for about 150 years. And they know how to build engines. Everyone knows how to build engines. So how do we solve this problem that we have? So what they've done is the whole world, as we pretty much know it today, has gone to alternative fuels. Well, that was the wrong decision because fuels is a symptom. It's not a cause. The cause of the problem is the way the engine is built itself. So that's what we set out to do is redesign the engine so we can live with existing fuels. Now, the best liquid fuel that you can possibly get is kerosene. And if you look at that, that's diesel fuel. Now on the Atlas missile, we use kerosene. That was the very best, has the most energy, and it's the heaviest fuel. The heavier the fuel, the more energy you have. And as you get the fuel a little bit lighter, like gasoline, it can bust a little easier, but has less energy. You can go further on a gallon of diesel than you can a gallon of gasoline. Now, the new thing is, oh, let's go with ethanol. Ethanol is an alcohol. Alcohol becomes lighter. It has about half the energy the gasoline has. So if you have a gallon of ethanol, you can only go half the distance as you can go with the gasoline. And gasoline can only go about two-thirds the distance that you can go with diesel fuel. So to go to alternative fuels, it becomes a real problem. And we find out now... To create ethanol, you have to use a lot of plain, good old-fashioned gasoline and diesel fuel. It has to take tractors that take and plow the fields. Say you're going to raise corn, you put tractors to plow the fields. It takes harvest machines to harvest the corn. All of that's being done with good old-fashioned engines that we have today. And it's burning a lot of fuel. Then when you get done with it, you end up with a fuel that is only got half the energy, and so therefore you have to burn twice as much of it. And when you burn twice as much, it's almost as polluting as if you had the plain old diesel fuel or gasoline fuel that we have today. So it isn't really too smart to go with these alternative fuels. Let's take natural gas. Natural gas is even lighter. It takes a lot more natural gas. Uh, we had a car built by Honda when we were working with this engine and trying to come up with a high-pressure compressor. And the tank had to be up to about 4, 000, well, 3,600 psi. 3,600 psi. That's a lot of pressure. The tank was about yay big in diameter across behind the rear seat of the car. And that's like a bomb. Now, as the pressure drops, the efficiency drops. And if you look at buses and so forth that go on natural gas, you see the top of the bus, you see across the top, you see a white piece sticking on top, and that's all pressure bottles hooked together, manifolded together to use one bottle at a time so you can keep the pressure up as much as you can across it. But that's a large fuel tank. Can you imagine putting a fuel tank like that in your car? So anyway... We had a little Honda had this, and on this tank that was probably 50 gallons of natural gas fuel, we could go 100 miles. 
and every day we had to fill it up again to go that same hundred miles. That's the maximum distance it would travel. So it, alternative fuels are not what they're necessarily cracked up to be. If you get hydrogen, that's even worse. And now let me tell you about ethanol. It's a dangerous fuel. First of all, everyone knows you can't see an alcohol fire. How many times have you seen racing engines which use alcohol and the guy's jumping all around and you know why is he jumping around because he's on fire but you can't see it it's terrible to have a fire you can't see in the missile industry we were worried about hydrogen fires because we use hydrogen fuel later on you know how we detected a hydrogen fire take a broom up if the broom would ignite oh, they had a fire going because you couldn't see it now a broom is a very simple technology but that was the only way we could detect uh, with heat, we knew it had heat, but we didn't know where the fire existed or where the leak existed. So anyway, the whole country has gone to alternative fuels, and that was the wrong answer. The answer is, let's solve the problem with the engine so that you could take and burn more of the existing fuel, gain a lot more energy, uh, energy out of the existing fuel, and don't put anything in the atmosphere. Well, we started and we worked on that. But the problem that you had was still this head, head on engine, and a head gets very heavy, especially on a diesel engine because it has high pressures. To give you an idea how much pressure we're talking about, is a diesel at one atmosphere, and that's normal pressures that we have around us, is only 14.7 psi. That's what the atmospheric pressure is. Now, if we pump that up and get it to one and a half atmospheres of pressure, that's still only about 21 psi, not very much. If you have a 20 to 1 compression ratio, which a normal diesel engine is, that's 294 psi. That's not a whole lot of pressure, but it's enough pressure that anything much more than that will break the engine. To give you an idea, it doesn't take much. Take yourself a champagne bottle. If you're familiar with a champagne bottle, it's got a radius in the bottom. Why does it have that radius? If it was flat, it would just break. It requires that radius curvature to push the glass into compression, like the arch on a, on, a, uh, on a bridge. You have to push it down and bend it to the outside edge because glass is very good in compression, not very good in tension. You pull glass, it'll break apart. So everything needs to have that radius. You look at Coca-Cola can, it's got a radius in it. Anything that has any pressure whatsoever, has a radius. So, with this head, our problem was is that it's a flat surface. Now, if you take a simple one-cylinder gasoline engine that's on a lawnmower or something, everybody understands how that works. Uh, you have a, a little engine, you have a big heavy head across the top, and the piston goes up and down, and that's the way the engine works. Now, if you got really smart and you build two engines like that and they're going up and down, you think, gee, there's no problem to that. We know how an engine works. Now, all we did is we solved the problem. We cut the head off, turned the engine up so that they were, the two pistons were opposed to each other. Each piston acting as the compression push that instead of the head is pushing against the other piston. Since the piston's not attached to the sidewalls, it's just floating inside, you eliminate all those stresses, and you can pressurize it all you want to pressurize it. And I give you an idea, 